Comenzamos entonces con la regla de la cadena. Here we'll prove the chain rule for finding derivatives of composite functions, and we'll see some examples too. Say you have a function y of x, and now let's look at a more complicated function, z of y of x. So for an input x, you compute y of x, and then you take y of x and put it into the function z. A function of a function is called a composite function. The chain rule is what will let us find the derivatives of composite functions. Here's an example. What's the derivative of the sine of 5x cubed? You know the derivative of sine is cosine, and you know how to find the derivative of 5x cubed. But what's the derivative of the sine of the function 5x cubed? Okay. To find out, we'll need the chain rule. To work out the chain rule, we'll use linear approximations. Suppose you have a function, which we'll call f of x. Let's look at the x-coordinate a, where the output of the function is f of a. If we look at a nearby point where the x-coordinate is a plus h, the output is f of a plus h. But if f of a plus h is hard to compute for some reason, we can approximate it using the tangent line at x equals a. This gray point is called the linear approximation for the purple point at a plus h. What's the y-coordinate for this linear approximation? We're interested in the y-coordinate of this gray point here, and we know the y-coordinate of this orange point here. That's just f of a. So what's f of a plus h? Or the approximation, that gray point? Well, it's approximately equal to f of a plus a small change in y. That small change in y, if you draw it over here, is a leg of a right triangle. The other leg of that right triangle has a length of h, and this part of the triangle is on a line whose slope is f prime of a. Another way of writing this slope is as the change in y divided by the change in x. Here, that's the change in y divided by the change in x, which is h. If we solve this equation for the change in y and plug it in up there, we find that the approximation is f of a plus f prime of a times h. Exactly. The y-coordinate of this gray point is f of a plus h times f prime of a. And this is the linear approximation. When h is small, f of a plus h can be approximated with f of a plus h times f prime of a. As h gets smaller and smaller, meaning the purple and orange points here get closer and closer together, this approximation becomes more and more accurate. Let's hold on to the linear approximation formula down here. And now let's tackle this derivative head on. Using the definition of the derivative, you can write the derivative of z of y of x as the limit as h goes to zero with an h in the denominator. What's the missing numerator here? ¿Cuál es el numerador en esa función? Es 4.15.2 a 
B, C, D. Sí, tienen esto, la, la, la derivada de una función que tiene a su vez una función de B. B. Probamos con B. ¿Quieren que ponga la explicación? Sí. The definition of a derivative usually looks something like this. The derivative of f of x is equal to the limit as h goes to zero of f of x plus h minus f of x all divided by h. In this problem, instead of f, we have z of y of x. So every time we see f of something, we have to replace it with z of y of that same thing. Why don't you try making these substitutions in this definition and see if you can get the answer? Right. The numerator of this derivative is the composite function evaluated at x plus h, so that's z of y of x plus h, minus the function evaluated at x, which is z of y of x. Let's look at the y of x plus h inside the z here. We're taking the limit as h goes to zero, so h is going to be very, very small. If you apply the linear approximation to y of x plus h, what do you get? ¿Qué pasa? Aplicamos la aproximación. La aproximación lineal. ¿Cómo podríamos describir y de x más h? La c. ¿Ponemos por qué? Sí. Okay. If you want to use the linear approximation formula, we now have to replace our function with y, because f is going to become a y, and instead of an x, we have an a, because a is going to become an x. The right-hand side is then y of x plus h times y prime of x. Excellent. Yes, for very small h, y of x plus h is approximately equal to y of x plus h times y prime of x. So let's plug this result back into the limit. And now we're evaluating z for the input y of x plus h times y prime of x. This is tricky. But can you apply the linear approximation again for this expression? As h gets very small, this whole term here, h times y prime of x, also gets very small. Bien. Usando la aproximación lineal, ¿cómo podríamos ver este de C? To start, why don't you call this a different small number, like p? So we're trying to find z of y plus p, where p is a very small number. Try using the local linear approximation on that.
If we call this second term here P, then we're trying to find an approximation for Z of Y plus P. And that's approximately equal to Z of Y plus P times Z prime of Y. That's using this formula down here. And here we have Z of Y plus P instead of F of A plus H. So what's the first term? Well, that's Z of Y. And Y is actually Y of X. That's Y of X. And P is H times Y prime. So it's H times Y prime of X times Z prime of Y. And Y was Y of X again. Very well done. Let's quickly see how you got that using the linear approximation formula down here. Z is the function we're looking at. Y of X is like the point A, and the term inside the function Z that's getting really small is H times Y prime of X. So F of A in the linear approximation formula becomes Z of Y of X. The H over here becomes H times Y prime of X, and F prime of A becomes Z prime of y of x. Great. So this expression here is the linear approximation of the function z when h is really small. Let's plug this back into our limit. Now, can you evaluate this limit? Note that you have a z of y of x here and a minus z of y of x here. So those two will cancel out. Now you're left with just this expression here. Can you find the limit as h goes to 0 of that? Right. Looking at this limit, you saw that the z of y of x is subtracted over here. So these two terms cancel out. This is a limit as h goes to 0. But the only places where h shows up are here in the numerator and here in the denominator. These h's cancel out. And now that we've gotten rid of all the h's, we don't need to worry about this limit anymore as h goes to 0. So the derivative of z of y of x is this funny looking expression over here. This is one way to write the chain rule. But let's play with this expression a little. First, since we're multiplying these y prime and z prime terms together, we can switch their order. You know y is a function of x, so let's not bother writing the x over here. And here's the chain rule. The derivative of the composite function z of y of x is equal to z prime of y times y prime of x. To see what this means, well, let's try using the chain rule to work out the derivative of the function you saw earlier in this tutorial. Let's find the derivative of the sine of 5x cubed. First off, if you were to write the sine of 5x cubed as z of y of x, what are the functions y and z? A ver, usando ese como ejemplo, ¿cómo se resolvería si es válida la regla de la cadena? ¿Cuál sería la solución para esa derivada? Otra vez, 
tenemos una función dentro de otra función. Esta es una y esta es otra. Es una función dentro de otra función. Es la derivada de esta por esta función por la derivada de esta función por esta función. Ahora sí. Vamos a poner por qué. The function y of x is going to be the first thing you do to x. In our example, the first thing you do to x is plug it into 5x cubed. So y of x is going to be 5x cubed. Z is the thing that you do to y. What do we do with y or 5x cubed? We take the sine of it. So z, y, is going to be the sine of y. Right. In this formula for the chain rule, y represents the inner function, the one you're applying directly to the input x. So y of x equals 5x cubed. Once you have 5x cubed, z is the function you're applying to that output. So z of y equals the sine of y. Now that you've identified the functions y and z for this example, try using the chain rule to find the derivative of the sine of 5x cubed. Si aplicamos la regla de la cadena, nos da 4.15.7. 4.15.7. ¿Cuál? ¿Sí? Es necesario como la. Ya todo. La, la, ahora sí la pescamos. Great job. Let's see how you got that. If z of y equals the sine of y, then z prime of y equals cosine y, since the derivative of sine is cosine. Now our original function here is the sine of 5x cubed. There's no y in this function. We just made up a function y and set it equal to 5x cubed. When we're finding the derivative of the sine of 5x cubed, the result should be another function of x. Let's replace the y over here with 5x cubed, so we see that z prime of y equals the cosine of 5x cubed. That's z prime of y. The chain rule says we're supposed to multiply that by y prime of x. y equals 5x cubed. And to find the derivative of a power, you take the expression, multiply it by the power, and subtract 1 from that power, giving us 3 times 5x squared. 3 times 5 is 15, so y prime of x equals 15x squared. And that's how you found the derivative here. It's the product of z prime of y and y prime of x, which is the cosine of 5x cubed times 15x squared. The answer looks a little nicer if we put the trig function at the end. So we can say it's 15x squared times the cosine of 5x cubed. So great job with that one. Let's leave the result down here, and let's try one more example. Try using the chain rule to find the derivative of e to the tan of x. Again, you'll want to identify what the functions y and z are in this composite function, and then find z prime of y and y prime of x. Para ese ejemplo, de una, de una función exponencial, ¿cuál sería el resultado? Una función exponencial de una función logarítmica. La B. La C. Vamos a ver por qué la tuvo ahí una. The first thing this function does is it takes the tangent of x. So the inner function, or y of x, is equal to tangent of x. The second thing that you do is you take e to the output of that. So the second function, or z of y, is going to be e to the y. Why don't you try using those functions and the chain rule to figure out the derivative?
if z is equal to e to the y and y is equal to the tangent of x, then z prime of y is just e to the y because the derivative of e to the y is e to the y. We can also write that as e to the tangent of x by substituting for y. What's y prime of x? Well, the derivative of tangent is secant squared. So y prime of x is the secant squared of x. Now that you have y prime and z prime both in terms of x, you can plug them into the chain rule. Give it a shot. Good work. You identified y of x as being the exponent here, which is the tangent of x. And you found that z of y is e to the y. The derivative of tangent is secant squared. And the derivative of e to a power is also e to that same power. Since e to the tan x is a function of x, you replaced the y over here with tan x. And so the derivative of e to the tan x equals e to the tan x times secant squared x. Here are the derivatives you found for the two composite functions we looked at. So why is this called the chain rule? Well, if you're finding the derivative of z of y of x, first you find the derivative of the outermost function evaluated at the inner function, so that's z prime of y, and you multiply that by the derivative of the inner function evaluated at the input inside it, which is y prime of x. These steps are like links in a chain. This is the chain rule for taking the derivative of a function of a function. But the chain rule also works when taking the derivative of a function of a function of a function. What does that mean? Well, say you have a composite function that's composed of three functions, like w of z of y of x, and you want to find the derivative of this mess. Here's the derivative, and you can find it using the chain rule. First find the derivative of the outermost function evaluated at the function inside it, and you can keep working your way inward. So the derivative of w of z of y of x equals w prime of z times z prime of y times y prime of x. You can also get the same result by working your way outward. Start with the innermost function, which is y in this case, and find its derivative. Then multiply that by the derivative of the next innermost function, so that's z prime of y. And finally, multiply that by the derivative of the outer function, so that's w prime of z. You can apply the chain rule in either direction, inward or outward, and they both give you the same answer. Vamos a continuar con esta que nos va a ayudar un poco mejor a entender que, qué es esto. In this tutorial, we'll try to get a better understanding of the chain rule. You use the chain rule to find the derivative of composite functions, like z of y of x. So first, let's focus on the y of x here. Here's a graph where you can make your own function y of x. When you're ready, press done. And now, you can make your other function z, which takes as an input y. So after you've finished making your function z of y, press done. And what you're going to see down here is the graph of z of x. It's z composed with y. y of x is drawn over here, and z of y, rotated 90 degrees, and you'll see y in a little bit, is drawn over here. Okay, so down here is our function z of x. Now at this point, you can drag your finger over the graphs and see the derivatives on all three. So right over here, here is dy dx, the derivative of y with respect to x. Here, if you rotate your head 90 degrees, you can see dz dy, the derivative of z with respect to y. And down here is dz dx. Try playing around with this a little. Make your own functions y and z. The first question is when is dz dx, this derivative down here, when is that derivative equal to zero? La derivada de z en función de x es igual a 0. La derivada de z en función de x, o sea, es esta. La derivada de la función de esta es igual a 0. Y unos, por supuesto, debemos considerar que es una función que es x, que es función de z, antes es función de y. 
Entonces, por eso tenemos que considerar eso. ¿En qué condiciones de la relación con Y se da esta? No sé está. Se duerme fácilmente. ¿Cuál sería entonces? Cuando D y en DX es menor que 0, D y en DX para que D, Z en DX sea 0. Cuando D y en DX es 0, o sea, cuando la derivada de Y en función de X es igual a 0, cuando la derivada de Y en función de X es igual a 0, sería cuando está, ¿no? Bueno, es casi cero. ¿Sí es cero? Así. La que necesitamos es esta. De aquí valga cero. ¿Cuánto vale ahí la derivada? Recuerden que la derivada es la pendiente. Cuando es menor que cero, ¿qué pasa cuando la derivada es menor que cero? O sea, negativa. La derivada es negativa esta. La derivada de Y en función de X. Cuando la derivada de Z en función de, de Y, pues esta de acá, es eh, menor que cero cuando la derivada de Y... Ah, pues esta también. La derivada de Y en, en función de esta es menor que cero. O cuando la derivada de Y en función de esta es igual a... Ahí sí. Entonces, ¿en qué casos es? es igual a cero. Cuando estas dos derivadas son iguales a cero. ¿Sí? Ahí me voy a poner un esto aquí. Hay ocasiones en las que tenemos fenómenos que dependen de otros fenómenos que dependen de sus variables específicas. Entonces, la, el, primer, el fenómeno que nos interesa no depende solamente de la primera variable que estamos viendo o midiendo. Esa variable puede estar a su vez siendo afectada por otra variable que quizá no habíamos visto, que tendríamos que buscarla y una vez identificarla, tomarla en cuenta. ¿Correcto? Bien. Great job. You found that the derivative of this graph is zero when either the derivative of this graph is zero or the derivative of this graph is zero. Now, as you move your finger around, you can see the exact values of the three derivatives reported down here. Looking at these three derivatives, is there a relationship between them that always seems to be true? Hay alguna forma en la que siempre eh, sea correcta la relación entre de, la derivada de y en dx, la derivada de z en dy y la derivada de z en dx, o sea, que estas sean igualdades. El producto de la derivada de y, de z en, en función de y y de y en función de x es igual a la derivada de z en función de, y, de x. Por la derivada de z en función de x, por la derivada de y en función de x es igual a la derivada de z en función de y. Por la derivada de z en función de y, por la derivada de z en función de x es igual a la derivada de y entre la, la derivada de y en función de x. ¿Cuál de esas tres igualdades es eh, válida? La B. La B. La C. La C. A ver, tú dices que la C y tú dices que la A. No, la A. ¿Ya cambiaste de opinión? Sí, la Está dando por tu lado. Más ¿No bien. If we take a look at this point here, we see that dy dx is equal to 2, dz dy is equal to 1.46, and dz dx is equal to 2.92. Try plugging in these three values to each of the equations over here and see which equation turns out to be correct. Por cierto, se fue la 4.16.2. La anterior fue la 4.16.1. Vamos a la 4.16.3. Ok, so you found that dz dx always equals dz dy times dy dx. Let's look at the derivatives and see if we can figure out why that is. 
dx represents a small change in x, so it's the width of this blue bar here. And dy represents the corresponding small change in y, so it's the width of this orange bar. And dz you find by looking at the change in z, so that's the width of this green bar over here, which also happens to be equal to the width of this green bar down here. So you can think of dx, dy, and dz as being small changes in x, y, and z. So when you look at this equation again that you came up with, the dy's cancel out. And that leaves you with dz over dx on both sides. So if dz over dx equals dz over dy times dy over dx, you should be able to make this term negative and this term negative and get a positive value for dz dx. Make it so. Okay, so given the composite function z of y of x, you found that dz dx equals dz dy times dy dx. Another way to say this is that the derivative of z with respect to x equals the derivative of z with respect to y times the derivative of y with respect to x. You might have noticed that this looks similar to the chain rule, which is the rule you use to find the derivative of composite functions like this one. Suppose you want to find the derivative of this composite function, z of y of x. What does the chain rule say this derivative is equal to? Right. The chain rule says that the derivative with respect to x of z of y of x is z prime of y times y prime of x. Now let's see if we can find another way to write this formula. Let's start with the y prime of x term over here. What's another way to write this highlighted expression? Exactly. Y is a function of x, so you can rewrite y prime of x as dy dx. Similarly, we can rewrite z prime of y as dz dy. Finally, let's look at this expression over here. Inside the brackets here, we have the function z, and we're taking the derivative of z with respect to x, meaning we're looking at how z changes as x changes. So how can we rewrite this highlighted expression? Yeah, this is the derivative of z with respect to x. 
so we can write this expression as dz dx. So this relationship among the derivatives that you found earlier in this tutorial is exactly the chain rule. As you saw earlier, you can think of the dx, dy, and dz terms in the chain rule as small changes to x, y, and z. So this equation isn't too surprising. The dy terms in the numerator and denominator cancel out, leaving us with dz over dx equals dz over dx. But let's put the dy's back in. This is the simplest way to write, as well as to remember, the chain rule. Okay, last question. Let's put the chain rule to work. Consider the function e to the minus x squared. That's e, and the power it's being raised to is minus x squared. What's the derivative of this function? What's the derivative of the function e to the minus x squared? e a la menos x cuadrada menos 2x por e a la menos x cuadrada menos x cuadrada por e a la menos x cuadrada o 2x cúbica por e a la menos x cuadrada la p vamos a poner por aquí vamos a el último if this expression here is z then what we're trying to find is dz dx. To do that, we'll first find dz dy and dy dx for some intermediate function y. What's y? Well, y is the first thing that we do to x. Here, the first thing we do to x is take minus x squared. So let's say y is minus x squared. If y is minus x squared, then we could write z as e to the y. What's dy dx? Well, that's going to be minus 2x. And what's dz dy? Well, the derivative of e to the y is just e to the y, so that's e to the y. Finally, you can plug everything into the chain rule. So dy dx goes here, and dy dz dy goes there. Now just remember, you don't want any y's left over, so you're going to have to plug in for y using your expression over here. Here we'll find the derivative for exponential functions of the form a to the x, and we'll do it using the chain rule. So we want to find the derivative of the function a to the x, where a can be any positive number. But before we study a to the x, let's first look at the number a by itself. What's an equivalent way to write the number a? Exactly. One of those equivalent ways is e to the natural log of a. 
Can you use this equation to find an equivalent expression for a to the x? Otra forma equivalente en la que podemos eh, escribir ahora el número como exponente. ¿Cuál sería? La a y c. Otra vez. A y c. C, b y c. Por la misma razón. Right. A to the x equals e to the natural log of a, all raised to the x. When you take a number, raise it to a power, and then raise that result to another power, you can multiply the exponents together. So a to the x equals e to the natural log of a times x. So if we want to find the derivative of a to the x, we can equivalently find the derivative of this expression, e to the natural log of a times x. Try using the chain rule to find this derivative. Ahora, podemos usar la regla de la cadena para encontrar la derivada de esa función exponencial. ¿Cuál sería entonces el resultado? Es la... Eh, 4.17.3 4.17.1 la C. Alguien dijo la C. Alguien dijo la B. To find this derivative, we'll need to use the chain rule. Let's call this thing that we're trying to find the derivative of Z. So Z is equal to E to the ln of A times x. And to make things simpler, let's call this y. So y is equal to the ln of a times x. Now we can rewrite z as just e to the y. What we're trying to find is dz dx. That's this derivative here. And the chain rule tells us that this is equal to dz dy times dy dx. Why don't you find dz dy and dy dx using these expressions and then use that to find dz dx. Remember, your final answer should not have any y's on this side, only x's. Okay. Well, let's see how you got that. To apply the chain rule, you first looked at the innermost function, which is the exponent here. The natural log of a is a number, and the derivative of a constant number times x is just that number. So the derivative of the exponent here is the natural log of a. The next step in the chain rule is to consider the larger function, which is e raised to the function we just looked at. The derivative of e to a power is also e to that very same power. So let's move that over here. This derivative is equal to the natural log of a times e raised to the natural log of a times x. What's an equivalent way to write this expression on the right? Exactly. You found earlier that e to the natural log of a times x equals a to the x. So let's replace this term with a to the x. 
and we can modify the left side of this equation by similarly replacing the e to the natural log of a times x with another a to the x. And there you have it. The derivative of a to the x equals the natural log of a times a to the x. This derivative is still an exponential function, but now it has a coefficient that's the natural log of the base a. Now let's use this formula. Let's find the derivative of the function 5 to the x. This derivative is equal to some number times 5 to the x. What is this missing coefficient? What is the number? 5 is the example of the number derivative of 5. It's the number of 5 to the x. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Awesome. To find the derivative of 5 to the x, we can use this formula, where a is equal to 5. So the derivative of 5 to the x is the ln of a, or the ln of 5, times a to the x, or 5 to the x. If you use the calculator to find out the ln of 5, we see that it's equal to 1.609. So this is equal to 1.609 times 5 to the x. And this is the answer. terminamos la regla de la cadena Bien. que nos permite eh, resolver derivadas de funciones compuestas que son funciones que dependen de otras funciones y ese es el pan de cada día en fenómenos complejos como los que nos eh, finalmente la evolución de las especies depende de la a selección natural pero la selección natural depende a su vez por ejemplo de la diversidad de la prole y depende de las variables ambientales entonces son fenómenos que dependen de fenómenos o variables que dependen de variables entonces a veces quizá sea indispensable que acudamos a este tipo de herramientas eh, y este será el siguiente tema que veamos pues apenas llevamos una hora y cinco minutos de clase realmente ¿quieren que empecemos con este? o lo dejamos para, para la próxima sesión lo dejamos para la próxima sesión ya ¿Vale? Nada más es para Android. Eh, no sé si alguien ya lo usó para Android. Para Android. Este, lo que sí la, lo encuentras eh, disponible los recursos en, el, en web. ¿Sí? Y ahí es en cualquier plataforma, sea PC, sea Linux, o sea eh, Mac, o cualquier otra que inventen mañana. O no sé si puede ser hasta plataforma Silicon Graphics. ¿Saben lo que es eso? Un sistema de plataformas de cómputo que había el siglo pasado, literalmente. Y eran las más avanzadas que había para gráficos entonces. Ya, para ya no existen, ya no existen ni en empresas. ¿Sí? Actualmente todo lo que se hace con gráficos se puede hacer con lo que hacían las con gráficos entonces se puede hacer con PC. Pero, ¿por qué muchos políticos como Linux? Porque porque es un, sistema, es un sistema operativo abierto y tú lo puedes modificar. Entonces, si tú desarrollas tu propio software, puedes este, eh, a meterte en las tripas del sistema operativo para que coincida con tu software. Cosa que si lo haces con el, con el, ni con Mac ni con Windows. Porque son sistemas registrados. Sí lo puedes hacer, pero es ilegal. Si te cachan, te vas a tanto. Entonces, eh, este tema es interesante porque eh, nos permite eh, usar, aplicarlo a ecuaciones que no son funciones, como una elipse no es una función. O incluso para fenómenos 
como puede ser el ya no solamente las tasas de crecimiento por ejemplo tasas de crecimiento poblacional eso lo habíamos visto tenemos fenómenos que habíamos visto que se pueden mostrar fácilmente de manera como una función que podría ser tal vez el crecimiento de organismos por ejemplo en decíamos el tal ¿no? o en masa que eran son los datos que usaban para los primeros ejercicios y para el primer examen donde teníamos X, que eh, podría ser el tiempo, teníamos eh, Y, que podría ser la, el peso, como lo llaman los pediatras, o la masa, masa de niños, la masa, la masa que contenía en un niño, ¿sí? en un infante, y veíamos la edad en meses y cómo cambiaba la masa, cómo va. Cómo va ¿Cómo se da un poquito la cartera de los papás? <risa> y vemos que al graficarlo tenemos una cosa más o menos así, ¿no? Donde tenemos el tiempo, tal vez en meses, para la, el primer año de vida, contra el peso. O poder hacer la talla también. Son muy parecidos. Y esto lo podemos, eh, podríamos estar interesados en cuál es. ¿Cuál es la, la, la rapidez de crecimiento? ¿Sí? La rapidez de crecimiento depende de la... De, de hecho sería de... No, la función con la función. Tengo un borrador y ya lo borré también. Con el teléfono. Y está en función de... X por algún coeficiente y quizá algún exponente, quizá. Bien. Pero eso es el valor para cada uno de estos puntos. Quizá lo que, yo, lo que me interese es conocer las pendientes que me, están diriendo, me estarán diciendo cómo va cambiando. Y es que la pendiente es la rapidez o velocidad de crecimiento. También podríamos pensar, quizá que los datos no son este, estos, sino que nos interesa el crecimiento de poblacional, el crecimiento de, de poblaciones, de, puede ser bacterias, en un cultivo, o, o, o en una infección, o, o lactobacilos en un cultivo, o conejos en una pradera o humanos en el planeta y tendríamos también el tiempo contra el número de organismos y tendríamos por decir algo, algo también de naturaleza y tendríamos que eh, la función también sea una función de y contra x en otras palabras n estaría en función del tiempo en un orden varía en función del tiempo con una un coeficiente, otra vez un coeficiente A y un exponente tal vez B, tal vez, tal vez, ¿cuánto vale? A lo mejor vale uno, no lo sé. Pero otra vez, quizá lo que nos interesa es la pendiente o la velocidad. Y la velocidad, tanto esta como esta, son, en este caso, si la masa, si es M, la masa, en realidad la velocidad es la derivada de la masa. Y acá la, eh, la velocidad, la velocidad es la derivada de la población. Esto hasta ahorita lo podemos resolver con lo que hemos estado viendo de las eh, eh, reglas de las derivadas, los, las definiciones de las reglas de, de las derivadas. Pero quizá lo que nos interesa no es solamente cuánto crece el organismo sea viva, podría ser un, no, no necesariamente un niño, podría ser una cría de alguna especie que estamos tratando de rescatar al reproducirla en cautiverio para luego reintroducirla y quizá queremos hacer un estudio más detallado de cómo es que va creciendo ese organismo 
incluso si está sano o no. Puede ser incluso para, para, para el caso de la salud de niños. Eh, y entonces lo que necesitamos resolver no es la talla y la masa, sino la relación entre ellas. La talla y la masa me habla más bien como de la, de la relación talla-masa me da la densidad. Eh, o quizá lo que me interesa es eh, algunos aspectos más bien físicos de cómo cambian las especies en función del entorno y por qué es que los elefantes tienen huesos gruesos y los ratones tienen huesos de campo. Ahí tenemos una relación entre la masa y, puedo decir, una relación de algún tipo de la masa y el volumen. Y estos van cambiando a su vez en función del tiempo. Entonces, eso lo podemos abordar con el tema que ahora entonces si veremos la próxima semana, porque va a estar en toda la Entonces nos vemos el próximo jueves.